Hello everyone and welcome to this session on uh, Open Education Champions. So OE Champions is a, a chance to talk to uh, OE advocates and actors uh, around uh, all Europe. Um, and we are talking to you, uh, Jacques, as an OE champion today. Uh, the intent of this uh, video series is for students, teachers, uh, practitioners of open education like yourself um, to discuss the importance of uh, open education and to share experiences uh, regarding the creation of uh, OER, uh, the production of more OER and uh, the inspiring of uh, other people to, to do the same, to, to produce OER. Um, and really underlying the role of librarians uh, such as I uh, in the process. So my name is uh, Vincent Delaven. Uh, I'm a librarian uh, actually at uh, the Sorbonne Nouvelle University in Paris. And I am very welcome, very pleased, sorry, uh, to welcome Jacques Dang, uh, which is a secretary of the board at uh, l'Université Numérique. Uh, and uh, I'm th I thank you very much uh, for talking uh, to us today. Thank you so much, Vincent. I'm very happy and deeply honored to share this time with you, to share ideas about open education with a large community of practitioners and researchers. So this is a very welcome opportunity to discuss issues that are important for our colleagues within universities and within the realm of training and education, lifelong learning. So thank you again for welcoming me. You're very welcome. Uh, so we will begin with a kind of a, a little bit question. Uh, concerning uh, your work with uh, open education, open educational resources uh, and uh, open pedagogy uh, as, a, as a whole. Uh, as an individual, so yourself, how did you come to be involved in uh, open education? Well, uh, our organization, l'Université Numérique, the French Digital University, uh, federates uh, higher education institutions in France, mostly universities, originally around open educational resources and the use of open educational resources by academics within uh, the universities. So it's kind of a natural way for us to uh, uh, encounter uh, open educational resources and develop practices around open education to address the needs of both the students in our universities, but also of the learners outside our universities. So you're working closely with uh, uh, practitioners of open education and also recipients of uh, and people who share and read uh, these OERs. That, that's the tradition of uh, my background, uh, the French Grandes Écoles. It's very much about what the learner, what the student gets from uh, his pedagogical experience with the institution, with the programs and with the teachers. So. Academics and the content producers are very important, but what is of the utmost importance is that we bring a significant exp learning experience to our students. Both to uh, have a, a very much improved learning experience within the universities and also to be able to learn to learn within the professional world. Thank you very much. Um, how would you say that librarians supported you or your organization on the, uh, did that uh, open education journey you described? Well, originally there was a, a strong, a somewhat strong competition between various people involved with uh, technology, with pedagogy. We had the people from the audiovisual world, we had the people from library, we had the people from data processing and we had the academics and the learners. I'm glad to say that today, all these sep originally separate communities work together. And especially for librarians, it's very important for us to have people, experts that guide us to the maze of information that is available in digital format or in libraries. And today, we have had very good experience with, uh, in collaborating with the librarians. And we can also have a specific project with them for open educational resources. It's not only about the production of open educational resources, but it's about making them known and available to learners and the general public. So issues, so, so issues such as indexing, 
such as publication, in which librarians are the utmost experts, are very important for us because we need to spread the world, to spread the world, sorry, and to make these OER available to the larger public. Thank you very much. Um, could you say, in your in your own opinion, uh, who has benefited from open education uh, uh, thanks to the work uh, done at Université Numérique? Uh, I mean, within and beyond the institution, because you serve a sort of a national network. Uh, so I won't ask you uh, who uh, for you has benefited and what have been the key benefits uh, from uh, the expansion of uh, open education? In our experience, uh, the onset of the pandemic has been a turning point. Uh, before the pandemic, it was much more for us uh, a task of uh, working with the people who were already interested in innovation for pedagogy, for the people who were on the leading edge of learning, teaching, and uh, convincing students and embracing knowledge. So it was less uh, focused on institutions, on faculty departments. It was very much focused on what an individual teacher could bring to uh, its talented students. With the onset of the pandemic, we have had a different focus because we had different requests. We had a request for content that is more closely aligned with uh, 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 academic programs with, uh, let's say, 30 hour courses, something that can be used uh, operationally for teaching, not only for developing innovative approaches. And also we've had uh, to address two different types of populations, at least the ones, ones that were originally involved in e-learning, in uh, innovative pedagogy, very much focused on cognitive issues, and the newcomers, those that had no experience with uh, distance open education and who just wanted to broadcast their lectures to their students one week after the onset of the pandemic with little change, if any, from what the lectures they were doing in the classrooms or amphitheaters. So the needs of these two populations and there are other categories also, but these two main uh, categories are very important for us and we needed to address them in, in different ways, of course. So we've moved from, uh, let's say, innovation in pedagogy for the individual academic to more institutionalized, hybrid, massified uh, use of uh, open education and also in the process with an extended reach outside the walls of the university. So more towards lifelong learning and uh, all that sort of... Uh... Yeah, much more uh, towards lifelong learning. We, we support uh, uh, adoption of open education, not for a single academic, but we have had greater success in uh, cooperation between different faculty members within a specific uh, uh, disciplinary department and also across departments because we now have people from medicine, healthcare, working with people from economics and management much more naturally than they used to in the past. And also we have uh, improved our outreach to students outside universities those, those with uh, limited access, with physical impairment, and also for those who were in uh, regions outside our previous scope, outside the scope of metropolitan France. So I'm thinking very much about uh, our colleagues from French speaking countries in Africa. As an example, we've shared our open educational resources with the um, major traditional university in uh, Senegal, in Dakar, as well as with the, with the virtual universities of uh, Congo, of Senegal, and Mali. And in the case of the Republic of Congo, we've already set up a specific platform for 
pedagogical continuity during the pandemic at the request of the Ministry for Higher Education of the Republic of Congo. Uh, last week, uh, my colleagues were in Togo to uh, develop the use of open educational resources and open educational practices for the universities of Lomé and Kara, because they, their national policy is quite clear. They have a very big demographic surge of students graduating from secondary education, and they're not willing, for budget reasons, to build a single additional building or classroom. They want open education to be available across the territory, from the south in Lomé to the north uh, at the border of Burkina Faso. They want to make it available to students wherever they are. Of course, there are additional issues such as the cost uh, of internet access. When the cost of what we feel is an ordinary internet access is about one third to one half of the median salary in, the, in Togo, mm. it's a bit of a challenge and we need also to address issues linked to the use of open educational resources, but which are separate from uh, the production of open educational resources. And the, the goal of this cooperation is uh, to help these uh, partners, but also in the end to learn from them also, to co-construct with them uh, the future past. As an example, um, we in France are a rich country. We have a lot of public universities, but in these uh, countries, they have room for what 10% of the students that graduate from secondary education. So their goal is also to promote private initiative for higher education. It's not to limit the reach of private initiative, but it's their goal is to have a good understanding of the way they operate and to regulate these commercial providers. So this is something we are less familiar with in France and something which we can learn from them also. Thank you very much. So I get from what you're saying that uh, the, the increasing of the, the reach of uh, French higher education is one of the key successes uh, of uh, the open education movement. Um, in your opinion, what are the other key successes uh, of uh, the open education movement from your own experience and uh, all the info and data you've gathered? I think when we had meetings with our colleagues in these universities, it was quite refreshing because they were very much uh, aware that uh, open education is not a choice. It's something that they have to embrace. And they, in a way, they're comfortable with it. They're not focused on the historic past benefits that uh, university status it grants you in traditional universities in Europe. They, need, they know they need to move forward. So what we aim to do is to help them uh, remove stumbling blocks. And also there's a specific context um, for, for better or for worse in these countries uh, that is linked to our uh, joint heritage. It's about uh, the fact that high education is seen as a public service more than uh, a market opportunity as it can be uh, found in Kenya or other English speaking countries in Africa. And there's also a slight difference between uh, copyright on the one side and intellectual property rights on the other side between common law and civil law countries. So this is something we've worked with UNESCO a lot to try to bridge these differences. And it translates into one obligation for us is that we have to have a strong relationship, a long lasting relationship with authors of content, because we need them to uh, allow us to keep their content freely available. In civil law countries, they have the moral right to remove this content from uh, public access. So, this is one of the reasons we need to have a good relationship with them. The second one is that there is, uh, we're not, we do not have that many open educational resources in, for, in French. 
as there are in English or in Mandarin. When one of our OERs becomes obsolete for technological reasons, such as the discontinuation of flash, or for content reasons, it's not the same as in the, in the US. We don't have another, courses, another course that emerges naturally and that uh, uh, replaces the one that is no longer usable. So that is an additional reason for us to have a strong relationship with authors. Regarding uh, the motivation of authors, as I said, they're quite dynamic in, in uh, African universities. What we can help them with is making them conscious of stumbling blocks, administrative stumbling blocks, because most of them are civil servants, again, uh, a joint heritage. So that means that uh, we need across the various government departments to have a joint, a common approach about the intellectual property rights of content that is produced, even when it is uh, within their administrative status as a university teacher. And the second thing that we need to do is uh, to um, work on the sustainability of uh, open educational resources. How do we motivate authors to keep them up to date? How do we reward them for uh, improving on a continuing basis year after year the quality of the content? That's something that is still an open question in many ways and something that we need to work out with them also. Thank you very much. Um, so yeah, you've talked at length about how the, the open education movement in Francophone and internationally uh, can support better French uh, open French language and of course uh, open educational resources. Um, so there is really that need of, of community, of international community uh, to, to have a stronger OER community. Um, you talked a uh, little bit um, about uh, the global adoption of open education across entire universities uh, in France. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, an, exp um, an experience you had? Uh, well, we're currently working on a project that is linked to the reform of the health studies in France. Uh, it's uh, slightly less competitive than in the past and puts greater emphasis on not on non-medical content. So uh, it's a competitive examination and the students in medicine are conscious now that uh, the grades they will have for healthcare studies is one thing, but the grades they will have for their minors, be it in economics, be it in law, or other uh, or psychology, will be important and can be key to the ranking they will have at the competitive examination. So we're currently working with our colleagues from healthcare to develop the minors uh, uh, in various fields, economics, management, psychology, English, and engineering studies that can be used by st students that are majoring in medicine and healthcare. So in a way, it has forced us to work together with uh, our colleagues in healthcare and to understand why uh, the requirements can be difficult, not from the student side, but from the way we operate. Because in our field, there is a shortage of uh, teachers for management and economics. And so there's no need to give additional teaching hours. On the other hand, in medicine and healthcare, there's no such shortage, so, but they're very much focused on providing more uh, teaching hours and also moving from uh, uh, traditional courses to more smaller courses, to courses with small, a smaller number of students and much more focused on, op on operational issues, on specific content and the specific learning of each student. So you would That's say that open education has uh, triggered more cross-disciplinary approaches uh, in higher institutions? 
exactly. And right. open education has done that, not because it has come and said that we can bring you that, but you are doing, you are reforming the learning path of, of the, our students. And this is how we can help you. We did not come and say, we have a solution for you. We said there is an opportunity for you to improve what you are doing currently and to improve the learning experience of students. You talked uh, a little bit uh, also about uh, supporting innovative practices of even individual uh, academics, uh, saying that there were two uh, main uh, areas of action uh, in your organization right now, which were the early adopters of uh, open education, which were very much uh, interested uh, in these uh, innovative practices and uh, more recent uh, persons uh, involved in open education. How do you uh, do you work with uh, individual uh, academics uh, which are uh, trying to develop uh, innovative practices right now? Uh, so it varies with uh, the, the level of expertise in pedagogy or technology of the individual teachers. At the basic level, we are provided with uh, Word and PowerPoint content with comments from uh, on each slide and also with the pedagogical scenario. Uh, some uh, early adopters are very keen on the, using new technology. So uh, for both of these uh, people, those who are not well versed in technology and those who are, we have, are good in technology, we have uh, what we call pedagogical engineers in our institution that can have expertise both in pedagogy, how do you centerize a content, or also in technology, because some of our teachers are very keen on using, for example, H5P in their new uh, uh, resources. So we are, have uh, teachers who do not have an idea of what H5P is, and others who want to uh, use a specific animation that is uh, available to H5P. So our pedagogical engineers can address the needs of both these uh, categories of teachers. And so the outcome for us, regardless of the expertise, the original expertise of the teacher, is to provide modular uh, content that can be aggregated in traditional semester-long courses for, let's say, what? 30 hours, 20 hours uh, of learning by the student. But for continuing education, it is done in a modular way so that uh, people who are moving back and forth between uh, their job in companies and training at universities can focus on a specific uh, uh, grain of content they are interested, not in a full course. They might be interested in the last uh, standard uh, for the Basel III banking regulation, for instance. So they don't need the overall course on regulations in banking. So this is done so that we can address the needs this time of, of both students in uh, their first degrees or learners uh, in, that are employed in companies and who are looking for long uh, uh, long life professional training. Very interesting. And do you think that um, because, as you said, there are more and more uh, teachers uh, and uh, institutions who come uh, to to seek advice and uh, to and come to adopt uh, globally uh, open educational resources and open education as a whole, that the the rising in numbers will lead to uh, the creation of. Uh, meta OERs, uh, that is uh, OERs that explain how to create OERs uh, in France? I think that's uh, one of the challenges we face. Uh, it's something that we need to think very hard on because that will be a challenge we will face in the coming years. We haven't reached quite that stage yet because we haven't reached a critical mass of content uh, or an, uh, an abundance of content yet. But that is probably the next step. 
how do you have uh, um, how do you automate the aggregation of course content either for a complete 30 hour course for university students or for a specific uh, professional training course for executive education that is something that we need to address both from a technological point of view and also we need to have a modular content that can be easily repurposed for the different target audiences. And that is something that is still a challenge that we need to address. No easy solution uh, in view, but definitely that's the path where we are going. You're right to uh, underline this, uh, this challenge. Well, speaking of challenges, um, in your opinion, what still needs to be done uh, for open education to truly take hold? I mean, uh, apart from the challenge we just discussed, what are the other key challenges today uh, in uh, open education? Well, the challenge, um, we've seen quite, uh, we've seen some aspects of these challenges, uh, this challenge in uh, our uh, partner countries in Africa. They are the stage, hopefully, where they are defining a national strategy, a national digital strategy for higher education and professional training. And we've seen that at universities, there is already a transdisciplinary approach with people from the cognitive science, people from the content side, people from technology. Perhaps there are not that many people from standards and norms working. I haven't seen many people from ISO working with uh, university teachers yes yet and that's something that we should improve at the government level on the other hand defining a national strategy can be a challenge because you have sometimes people from the ministries of education dialoguing with the people from the ministry of higher education tell them with the people from uh, uh, professional training and labor never with people from uh, foreign relations or economics and commerce. And yet, when our colleagues in universities say that we need to relax the rules on IPR and we need to increase the need for open source uh, software, when you are at the government level, you need to address the needs of other constituencies. In France, we both use BBB, Jitsi, open source software in universities, Moodle, of course. On the other hand, we have a world-class player for proprietary software, which is called Katia from Dassault System, which is the leading provider of uh, software for building aircraft, manufacturing aircraft. So when you are dialoguing at the world uh, intellectual property organization or the World Trade Organization in Geneva within the United Nations uh, scope, you need to be conscious of the needs of these two constituencies. You need to balance the needs. It's not that you are not going to do open software, not, but it, you need to understand fully what the diplomats from your country will be defending as a position in international negotiations. So greater understanding across ministries will probably remove, help remove stumbling blocks that people in universities are facing today. And you talked also about uh, the, the need uh, uh, earlier to improve sustain sustainability of OER development in a various regional contexts, which is a, a, a real uh, and true problem. And as you said, which can be experienced even in France with uh, uh, things which could seem uh, trivial, like a flash ending, but uh, create a, a gap, a dent in our resources. So very, uh, very interesting. Um, what would you say that uh, your plans are for the future are with uh, open education? I would say that uh, what we need, uh, still need today, is a greater involvement, greater discussion from different parties involved in uh, higher education, professional training, open development, because we don't have uh, a full understanding if we are providing content in economics, 
we don't have a full understanding if we are technology experts for fiber optics or for H5P development. What is important is that we take the time to discuss with our colleagues with uh, different backgrounds in order to do something that will not be perfect, but that we can improve over time in order to better fit the needs of students. So it's a continuing process, but I think that everyone who is involved in the open and distance education today has experienced that over the past uh, decades. So I think we are on the right path, but we need, and technology is there to help us, we need to uh, improve the quality and the breadth and the depth of our discussions about the issues that surround the use of open education, societal so use, economic use, legal issues. We need to take into account all these aspects. So that increasing discussion, inc improving understanding across various communities, that is a challenge that if we rise to the occasion, will help us continue to improve open education for our learners. Fantastic, thank you very much. Uh, is there anything you'd like to add? Uh, we come to the end of our, of our talk today. No, uh, I would like to thank you for the opportunity of having this discussion and also to bring this discussion to other colleagues uh, with you. So that thank you so much. And I hope we can continue in various forums in various uh, with various audiences and uh, work together. I hope we will. So thank you very much uh, again for being here and for this great conversation we just had. We just uh, really look forward to sharing it uh, with uh, all the open education community.